none of them personally remembered the beginning of this journey, most likely. The ones who had survived the longest were probably born in the wilderness on the way. Their fathers had been the ones who had seen what God had done in Egypt. Their fathers and their mothers had seen the plague strike the land of Egypt, but not the land of Goshen where they were. Their fathers and mothers had seen all the things that God had done once they left Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea. Surely that story had been told many, many times to these young children as time went on. They did remember some things. They remembered the travels in the wilderness as they uh, grew up. They remembered, at least in one way or another, the death of all who were above the age of 20 as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But at this point in time, they are now about to embark on what has been their goal all along. Israel now is about to enter the promised land. There's been a lot of preparation. There has been a lot of change. There has been a lot of rebellion. There's been a lot of punishment and discipline. But they're ready. They're not led by Moses anymore. They're led by Joshua. But God has already made it quite clear that Joshua is to take the place of Moses and receive the respect of Moses. However, today that's going to be even clearer. Because today, as they approach the Jordan River, they're going to have something to remember. Just as was the case when their forefathers stood before the Red Sea, this is not a body of water that can easily be crossed. The Jordan before them is not the Jordan at its low point, not the Jordan in the dry season. This is the Jordan during the flood where it overflows its banks, where it's rushing, where there's a mighty current. You don't ford this river at this time in this place. And yet Joshua has specific instructions, just as his predecessor Moses did. Joshua orders those who are carrying the ark, the priests who are in charge of carrying the ark of the covenant, representing the very presence of God. He orders them to step just a little ways into the Jordan. And as soon as their feet touch the water, all the way upstream, miles upstream, in fact, the water begins to change. As if held by some invisible force, which it is held by some invisible force, it doesn't flow down the river. It stops. And all of a sudden, there is dry ground before the Israelites for them to cross. An entire nation... Hundreds of thousands, possibly some have estimated maybe even a million or more individuals cross the river on dry ground. Now these people have something very similar to what their forefathers had seen to remember. That happens in Joshua chapter 3. But what happens in Joshua chapter 4 is what we want to look at this evening. Joshua chapter 4 is dedicated to the aftermath of this event. You might think that we move on from that and we just go immediately into conquest of Jericho, conquest of Canaan. But there's a whole chapter here that really slows down the pace. It focuses on one thing. And that one thing might seem like kind of a strange thing to focus on. As soon as they have crossed the Jordan... God speaks to Joshua, and God gives him an order. He says, I want you to pick out 12 men, one man from each tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel that have just crossed this river on dry ground. Each of those men is to go into the riverbed, the now dry riverbed that just a few hours before, before they began to cross, was flowing with a tumultuous current. I want them to go into the river, and each of them lift a stone. We might really describe it as a boulder that says that they're to pick it up and carry it on their shoulder. This is not a pebble. This is a stone, a large stone. 
each of these 12 minutes to take this stone. And they're to carry it. And you might think, what, do they carry it to the edge of the river? No, if you read, they're actually going to carry it all the way until they get to their campground for the night. It might not be super far, but it's not right on the other side of the river either. They're going to get a little distance between them and the river. They're going to have to carry this rock all that way until they reach the point where they will bed down for the night. And so these 12 men do exactly what Joshua <laughs> commands them by the order of God. They go down into the river uh, bed and they pick up these stones and they begin the journey carrying these stones. The text doesn't really say whether or not Joshua explains all of this to these 12 men or if the 12 men uh, have questions or if the people of Israel in general are wondering why are these these guys carrying rocks around with them. If you want a souvenir, you can find something a little easier to carry, right? But God told Joshua. And presumably at some point in this process, perhaps when they do reach their camp, Joshua does share this with the people because it is meant to be shared with the people. God says, I want you to take those 12 stones and I want you to pile them up. I want you to make a, a little monument in some areas in the culture we're familiar with, it might be called like a cairn or something like that. It was a, a monument that's made of stones just stacked on top of each other. Very simple. Doesn't take any kind of artistry or any kind of uh, craftsmanship. You're just stacking stones. It's one of the simplest kinds of memorials. But you find them around every once in a while. I found them actually going hiking in, in mountains, going hiking on trails. You get to the top of a mountain somewhere and... And there's just a pile of stones there. A memorial of those who have been there before. That's what they're to do. They're to take these stones or to pile them in a heap. And the children of Israel are to be told. These 12 stones, each one representing a tribe of your brethren. These 12 stones are a memorial. They're a memorial for you so that every time you see this, as you inhabit the land that you have now entered, that you are going to keep because God has promised it to you. Every time you see this pile of stones, I want you to remember what God has done for you. Every time your children see this pile of stones, children are actually curious and they're going to ask, Mom, what are these, uh, these stones here? Dad, why is there a pile of rocks here? What, what's the significance of this? And you get to tell them. I remember. I was there. I saw. I saw the river. As full as it is now, you can almost hear the parents telling their children. You see the river now as we're passing close by. It would get up on this hill and we can see it flowing. It was just like that that day. But when God, his presence represented in that ark that we now travel uh, to get close to, for the feasts, you know the feasts that we go to, son, daughter? Whenever we go to travel to uh, offer sacrifices, the presence of that God, when it uh, entered into the river, the river stopped. I've never seen anything like it. That's what God did for us. That's what God wanted us to remember. Now, why do we want to look at that story tonight? I mean, yes, it's a, a nice thought to remind ourselves of something God did for the Israelites way back when, but I don't think any of us end up strolling around the area of Gilgal and uh, see those stones. I'm sure they're not even there anymore. So what does this mean for us? What was the point of those stones? of spending an entire chapter on piling some rocks. It was to remember. It was to remember. And not just to remember, to do something to remember. To make sure they remembered. None of us have seen a river at flood state be parted so that people can walk across on dry land. 
But all of us have seen the work of God, the hand of God in this world. We know that everything, every blessing, every comfort, every positive, good, wholesome thing that exists in this world comes from God. And you and I enjoy a whole lot of those good, pleasant, wholesome blessings, don't we? Do we remember where they came from? How can we remember better? What can we do to remind ourselves of who has provided all this for us? I want us to consider briefly tonight three things that we can do to help us remember. First of all, what do we remember? What does it take to remember something? Well, we remember what we care about. We remember what we care about. You know, you have that stereotypical uh, situation with a, a husband and his wife. The wife is upset, the husband doesn't understand why. And finally, the wife blurts out, you forgot my birthday. I've never done that before. I've never forgotten anything that Liz wanted me to remember. But why does the wife get so upset? Because to her, it feels like that forgetfulness is a sign that he doesn't care. If he cared, then he would remember this. Obviously, he doesn't care, and so it slipped his mind. Now, it's not always fair, ladies, but sometimes it is, right? But the point is, we understand that the things we really care about, we remember. It's actually interesting, they've done studies. Memory is very closely attached to emotion. Think about memories from your childhood that you might uh, have seared into your mind. Why are they seared into your mind? Usually, there's some emotion. Maybe it's the, the, the sadness of know losing your favorite toy maybe that's one of your first memories maybe it's the excitement of your first birthday party that you got to actually invite people there's emotions attached to that we care about those things that's why they stick with us the question is are we investing that care are we intentionally caring about what god has done for us because if we're forgetting where everything that we have comes from, if we're forgetting all that we have that uh, ultimately has its origin in God, one of the simplest reasons might be we just, we stop caring. In Genesis chapter 40 and verse 23 as part of the story of Joseph, if you remember, he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife when Potiphar's wife, in fact, is the one very much in the wrong. He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he ends up in prison. God blesses him even in prison. He ends up helping these two individuals who have been put in prison, who were previously serving in Pharaoh's court, this cupbearer and this baker. He ends up helping them with interpreting their dreams, and one of them is released and goes back to serve Pharaoh. And Joseph has made a simple request. Please mention me to Pharaoh whenever you get out. And yet we read at the end of Genesis chapter 40, he forgets. He forgets about Joseph. And if we read that as we're reading that story of Joseph, as we're invested in Joseph's character in this story, we say, oh, how could you do that? How could you leave Joseph uh, like that and forget all about him? Why? Because we assume he didn't care and doesn't really seem like he did. Now, we're not told for sure it was any flaw in this man's character, but at least us as the readers, we're kind of angry with him. Because we feel like he should have cared more. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, we have this expression of care that is given uh, between the apostles and the church in Thessalonica. There has been uh, messages sent back and forth between Paul and the Thessalonian church through Timothy and others. And uh, as he is receiving those messages, he says, I'm so encouraged to know that you remember us. That you want to see us. Why does he care that they remember? Because that means they care about him. 
in Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. We have a beautiful psalm penned. There's a lot of repetition in it, as is common in the psalms, but the idea comes back to, bless the Lord, O my soul. That's how the psalm starts off. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. But then he's going to tell us why. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who heals all your diseases. And he goes on to list all of these different things God does. Things that we care about. Things that uh, make our lives better. Blessings that enhance not just uh, our spiritual walk with God, but even our comfort and our, our, our livelihood on this earth. Things that we don't have to have, but that he has seen fit to give us. If we forget what comes from God, have we stopped caring? Do I truly value all that God has done for me? If I want to remember, that's the first step. I got to care about it. But there's more things we can do to help us remember. Secondly, we remember what we celebrate. We remember what we celebrate. As they are crossing this Jordan River, something certainly they care about. They're entering this promised land they've been heading towards for years. But they also, they're going to set up a memorial. They're going, this is a, a kind of a ceremonial thing once it's explained to them, right? Right? You can imagine the congregation of Israel gathering around as these 12 men are piling up the stones. Once Joshua has disclosed to the people what the significance of this is, you can almost hear the scene. Maybe it's a, a hush that falls of the congregation, or maybe all of them are, are speaking out and, and, and saying some kind of praise to God. We don't know exactly how it transpired, but, but it meant something. It was something to celebrate it was a time to rejoice that's why we do a lot of things we do isn't it you ever wonder why we have wedding ceremonies you ever wonder why we have funeral services you ever wonder uh, why we have these very specific i guess almost rituals that we do during the important times of life the important events why, why do we have these events these ceremonies it's to remember. When you have a wedding ceremony, instead of uh, just, uh, you know, you want to marry me? Yep. You want to marry me? Yep. Okay, we're done. Uh, the reason why we don't do that in part is because having a ceremony cements in our mind, this is a big deal. You know, I was talking, I think it was actually to uh, Kevin Rhodes the other day about graduations if you remember uh whenever we had covid we had a, a weird situation with the graduations we ended up having the ceremony for the graduation after we actually graduated but we still wanted to have that ceremony and he was telling us one time about how uh, one of his degrees he had gotten it online and he had the option whether to actually go to the ceremony or not and he decided not to go and he regretted it later not because it would have made any practical difference but because there's just something about the ceremony of graduation that, that makes it real for you. I really did that. I really put in that work. I, I really accomplished something. It's different in our minds when we celebrate it, when we have something to, to commemorate. Some kind of memorial, some kind of ritual almost, if you will. And God knows that's how our minds work. You remember in Exodus 12, before this generation, there's already a memorial instituted. As the children of Israel preparing to leave Egypt, God instructs them to, to have a feast. Not just any kind of feast, a very specific feast. There to mark the doorposts with the blood of the lamb that they slaughtered. They're to uh, cook the lamb. They're to mix in herbs and unleavened bread. And it's a reminder of God passing over 
the children of Israel, as he executes judgment on the Egyptians. A memorial of what God has done for them. A memorial there to celebrate every single year for the rest of their generations, as long as the Old Covenant remains. In Esther chapter 9, we have another feast instituted, this time not by God, but by the Jews, to commemorate the deliverance of the Jews from their enemies. Esther, as we uh, talked about, I guess it's been a couple years ago now, wow, time flies. But we talked about how through a series of providential events, Esther is able to save the Jews from destruction at the hands of their enemies. Haman, of course, being the ringleader of all that. And as a result, once the Jews have been delivered, delivered and are in safety, they institute a feast. A feast again to be celebrated every year by the Jews all over the world. A feast to remember ultimately what God did for them. Even though those words are not stated in Esther, the Jews understand that was who they should give credit to. And of course, we also have a memorial that we celebrate, don't we? We did it this morning. There's something that we do. It's not uh, something that in and of itself seems like it would matter, but it reminds us. It reminds us. It's a way for us to take our focus off of all that's happening around us and to remember what God has done. We remember what we celebrate. But in our daily lives, do we celebrate? I'm not saying you have to make a ritual out of anything, but do you just stop and say, wow, look at all that God has done for me. Do you stop and, and uh, speak to uh, your family or your friend or whoever's around you and say, can we just stop for a moment and, and thank God for what he has done in this particular situation? Or maybe it's not even a particular situation, just life in general. Do we take time, even as uh, we just read a moment ago with the psalmist, do we take time just to celebrate, to commemorate what God has done in our lives? In your daily prayers, yes, we probably usually say something, thank you for this food, right? Or uh, thank you for uh, getting me home safely after a trip. But, but do we really stop and just pour out our thanks for everything? There's a lot beyond what we usually think of that comes from God. <coughs> but thirdly, we remember what we care about. We remember what we celebrate. But do we remember, or we remember also, what we talk about? We remember what we talk about. Whenever I was at preaching school, Pat, if you're watching, I'm not sorry. When I was at preaching school, one of our professors had a bunch of funny stories he would tell. And he had a bunch of funny stories in the sense that he had about five or six funny stories. But he told about 550 funny stories that were just the same story told about 50 times each. And we had fun with it. We teased him about it. And that was one of the things I loved about school is that uh, we were free to, to uh, tease and go back and forth like that. But we remember a lot of those stories. At the end of school, we still uh, would joke as we were leaving and even as we'd get back together after graduation or call each other or whatever, we'd still uh, talk to each other about some of those same funny stories that uh, are cemented in our minds now because we told them so many times. We remember the things we talk about. Not just funny stories or jokes, but the things we talk about because we care about them. Because we want to remember them. Because they mean so much to us that we just can't help it. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, that's what God says the Israelites are supposed to do with the law itself. He says that you are to teach these things diligently to your children. And you are to speak of them 
When you walk down the way, uh, when you uh, lie down, when you rise up, when you're sitting in the house, at every point in time, during all your daily activities, in other words, you are supposed to be talking about this with your family. You are supposed to be drilling this into their minds. Why? Why does the book of Deuteronomy itself even exist in the first place? You know that very first part of the word Deuteronomy, it means second. It's essentially a repetition of the law, saying it over again. Why? So they'll remember. The history of Israel after the book of Joshua is in many ways a history of a people who forget about God. And I would submit to you part of the reason they forgot it's because they stopped talking about it. They stopped talking about it with their family, with their children. Many times we have the words or something similar to the words of there arose a generation who did not know God. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, we have this episode in Mark, it's near the very beginning of the book, where Jesus heals a leper. And after he heals this leper, he wants this leper not to spread the word about what's just happened. And we can speculate about what that means. That goes beyond the, uh, the scope of what we're trying to do tonight. But he wants him not to say anything. And that ain't happening. Whether the man should have listened to Jesus or not, or all those kind of things, that's not what we're talking about here. But he wasn't going to speak silent about it. How could you? You've just been healed of a disease that's incurable. You've just been given life again. You were as good as a walking dead man until this man healed you. How can you not talk about it? How many people are going to remember the look in that man's eyes as he told them about it? How many of those people are going to want to go and find this teacher, this healer, after hearing the man that he healed talk about it. In Psalm 105, there the psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord. Make his deeds known among the people. And he goes on again, another psalm talking about all that God has done. But what does he want us to do? He wants, the psalmist wants us to tell people about it very least, would you want to tell your family, your friends, those closest to you? There's many reasons why you'd want to talk about it, but one of the most basic reasons I would think would be we don't want to forget. We want to remember. And yet I think about my own life. How much time do I spend talking to others about what God has done. How much time do you spend? I'm not talking about going out to someone who's not a Christian and saying, let me tell you what God can do for you. Yes, we should be doing that too. But I just mean in general conversation. Oh, God has blessed me so much in this area. God blessed me so much this month with this uh, happening in my life. God blessed me so much in this. Just as a general conversation, just as a general sharing of what's happening in my life, Shouldn't God be coming up so much? We remember what we care about, what we celebrate, what we talk about. Those are ways that we can constantly keep God and his blessings at the forefront of our hearts and our minds. So tonight, I want to ask all of us, what am I doing to remember what God has done? for me because I got to remember he spends a whole chapter talking about what Israel needed to do because it was that important for them to remember we've got to remember what God has done for us tonight if you need the prayers of the church or any assistance as we are all trying to not only remember but as we are trying to offer up to God ourselves in his service because of all he has done for us.
We would love to help you in that. If we can help, please let us know. We stand and sing.